welcome you to my podcast, Neue Musik Leben. I'm a soprano. I have cla studied classical singing, but I'm also doing lots of contemporary and experimental music. I just love singing. And I'm really excited that I'm now publishing actually once a month an episode in English because I realized that there's so many people who are already listening to the episodes I have and they seem to be so loyal. And, and also after I had this great trip to New York last year, I really had this um, impulse to say, okay, let's now do one English episode a month. So if you want to subscribe now to this podcast, you're so welcome because there will be one episode a month for you. More information on my website, www.ierenekyorka.de. I will put this in the show notes. And in this podcast, I talk with you all about contemporary music and especially the human beings in it. What motivates them all insider knowledge and yeah as many as you know I really love this work I love these talks with many many amazing people and musicians I'm cooperating with NMZ Neue Musikzeitung which is one of the biggest German speaking papers magazines about music in Germany and in today's podcast I'm talking with the composer Christina Van Su, and we had a great project last year in Paris and we're also going to talk about that but everything else I think she's a really amazing inspiring person so enjoy the interview with Christina Van Su. Hello, hello Christina Van Su. I cordially welcome you into my podcast Neue Musikleben. Hi, it's good to be here. And it's great to see you. I mean, we have been working last year on a great piece we did at Paris, the reintegration of the year. And I would like to know from you, how did you find your way into new and experimental music? Yes. Um, and thank you for participating in that work. It was really a highlight for me last year. It and was a highlight for me too. And we can also... Yeah put our great link into the show notes oh sure but we'll Everybody. talk about your work and then maybe we can also talk about this work yeah in definitely um how did I find my way into experimental music well I feel like experimental music found its way into me I was um really a sponge for music all my life whatever I could get my hands on whatever was playing, whatever was accessible around the house or in the local record store, which was Kansas City for me growing up. And also spending time in Greece, I was around, um, you know, I had my, my mom American, my dad Greek, and two very different um, cultural influences from just what you're immersed with what you're hearing on the radio um even trips with my grandmother to the greek orthodox church and being saturated by sound and smell and not following what every not not needing to know every word but um the chanting and the music uh captured my imagination and same with even the more experimental pop music that would have played on the radio as a kid I listened to the radio obsessively and when I was old enough I went to concerts and when I went to art school in Baltimore I spent every weekend uh, at the exper experimental music venue there There were a few, but I went to shows constantly and I was in love with music all my life. And uh, experimental music always left 
room in my imagination to to wander freely and, and be inspired and to fill my head with visions and um, this quality of experimental music it has always really I've really connected with and so um, it wasn't until much later that I started making experimental music this happened for me in my 30s around age 30 I started making records and experimentation was perfectly natural to me and continues to be a driving force in the records I make to to want to experiment with something and let it lead to some kind of result eventually. But the thirst for experimentation is really strong. And what are the qualities you most appreciate in the performers you work with? Wow, that's a great question. <laughs> Well, it's interesting how much the work is about listening in the end. We're all engaged in this listening practice together. And the ones that listen, um, I find such ease and efficiency and even grace sometimes, this beautiful quality of going somewhere together through in my case, it's often a verbal discussion uh, that gets things started and direction and simply someone who listens to direction, you know, and, and, you know, filters through their own apparatus and gives back what they can uh, in response. It's a beautiful interaction. It's a really Uh, thing I, I I love about the composer performer relationship is this back and forth, and as music is ephemeral, it's so malleable. This con this conversation with the performer. So I think someone when I when I'm lucky enough to work with someone who's very open and um, able to receive and give. Um, it's it's really wonderful. Yeah, I mean, we met last year, and somehow you you found me <laughs> through the internet and my singing and my voice, and then you asked me to sing this piece we just mentioned in Paris with GRM Radio France, and yeah, at first you just came by and you you had this text, and I sang it for you in different ways, and then. You used this material and you started building an amazing piece. And I was uh, very impressed also by your intuition, how you, I guess, pick the people, pick the music, and then has this have this great feeling for timing because, I mean, in the end, we put the piece together while we were in Paris and it was basically on the day of the performance, which also was my fault because I couldn't come earlier. And your husband, um, John yes. also Bennett was involved. He's, he's playing the flute. Yeah. But in the rehearsal, even though you were also challenged with the technique with all those many um, loudspeakers, but you were so clear, you knew exactly this has to happen then and this then. And Yeah, it was really, really amazing. And I mean, the whole is amazing and the sound is amazing there. But your to observe your clarity. And oh. even though I felt like, well, I just gave you some some little material and I was so yeah, it was a wonder and, and and awesome what what came out of it. And I love this piece. It's so mesmerizing it has this beautiful atmosphere and most people who who gave me feedback who listened to it already really liked it so do you mm -hmm. want to tell us something about your process of making such a piece or yes sure I mean thank you so much for articulating all of that it's it's also You know, when we're working, we're busy in the moment. There's so much to do. And it's it's always so nice to reflect on what happened. And 
um, the clarity is really important. We're, we're, we have somewhere to go together and you have a really strong feeling about it. And, and intuition is, I've definitely developed a strong intuition through music. There's um, feelings that guide everything. A feeling led me to you to reach out to you and your voice and, and um you said uh what you know I did a lot with what little you gave but I would say you gave a lot <laughs> and it's it was amazing how for me I was so impressed with um your openness and welcoming me to your space we recorded in your apartment which was really cool sometimes it doesn't have to be so complicated also I learned that time and time again, um, we recorded on a simple Zoom recorder. I gave you the text and within a short time, we had amassed an hour of tape with uh, variation on and spoken parts and sung parts and variation on the sung parts and uh, any given performance is usually 45 minutes. So if you already have over an hour of material from one meeting, it's, it's an incredible gift. And then, then things slow down. I take a lot of time to listen over many sessions with time in between so that I can feel something. If I listen all day long to a piece, you start to lose the intuition a little bit at the end. You've been burning it into your brain and your senses. And, and you know, I like to uh, give it a little space. I almost try, I try to forget it, the piece. <laughs> and then I listen again wherever I left off. And then again, the intuition is very strong and I know where to go and timing is clear and, where to put things so overall the preparing for the concert takes a lot of time because the materials have a beautiful efficiency if everybody's working together they come out very quickly like a spring and and then what to do to shape uh, a piece there's a lot of time and decisions and then I would say the the next one of the huge qualities that comes up between the way that I work with performers is trust because there's um, all this time that I'm working on something and it's changing a lot. So I'm very careful about when I share and what I share because it might change again and again. And then expectations start to, you know, get involved in, you know, I, I, I don't want to take everyone on the wild ride with me of the, <laughs> the composing because it sometimes is really all over the place but then with the performance you have um, an event and a and a place where you want it all to come together and every you want everyone to shine and especially an instrumentalist or a vocalist on stage you want them to feel good and um show the piece in the best possible light you can. And we were lucky in Paris with amazing conditions, an incredible auditorium, incredible sound system, arguably the best in the world, and a great engineer who also really worked with us and listened very well. And we shaped this immersive piece on the day and your performances came together on the day. And then that becomes this outside of time moment again. It's almost too fast to explain it in time. But if, if we're all, if we're working together, you can um, kind of skip rehearsal, skip all those hours. If everybody's has a, a confidence in doing and working that way, it's not for everybody. That's for sure. But those who are, you can really enjoy the performance in this very fresh way. So I think we achieved that very well in Paris. Yeah, it was a highlight. 
<laughs> last year from me um, doing this piece with you and John. And also, as you said, the auditorium is amazing. The team is amazing. There are all the people who work there. Um, I also was very impressed by the whole program, how it was programmed. I really, I really had fun being there the whole weekend and whatever I also could listen to. Um, you compose now for me. I'm a singer for the human voice. Is is that any different for you or is it special or more challenging to compose for the human voice? Yes, I find it very special. I I feel there's the voice is this incredible thing that you carry the the vocalist carries with them. You know, it's 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 part of them. It's not an in instrument that you pack in a case. And, and an instrument is also beautiful and special, and they're all different. But a voice is so built into the performer and the, like in your case, you have an ability to sing in a wide range and also how you deal with space between parts sung and ultimately your breathing and, and many things that are really so deep in yourself that I think it's, re it's for that reason, very special. And, and the voice also has, some qualities that we respond to in such a deep emotional way. They say that, you know, the baby and the mother connect in this incredible way based on the, the mother's voice. And, and so there's something so um, fundamental to voice and how um we perceive it that does make it really special and i and i also enjoy working off the paper with uh singers that you know since i don't notate there's there's a there's an incredible amount of expression possible with the voice also instruments off paper it's also great to work with any instrument that way But, um, yeah, I'm, it, it was a conscious decision for me to focus on voice and my work starting about five years ago. And I've learned a lot through a few collaborations with incredible vocalists that inform the way I, I work with all the other in, uh, instruments too. There's something, yeah, very direct about voice. And um, in my case, I don't know if this is true for uh, other composers, but I also have noticed a tendency for vocalists to be very open to this style of, uh, to my approach, maybe because voice is already, I don't know, what, what would you say to that? Would you... Do you have any thoughts on that? That there's something I don't know exactly. I don't know exactly what you mean. I mean, I feel that you really capture us very, very whole, not just the the, the singing or the sound, but maybe who we are or what else we whatever we do send out by our presence or or being. Yeah, and obviously your intuition leads you to the. Um, open singers right maybe <laughs> and um i mean i don't know <laughs> since you have not worked with everybody i don't know if, how it would be for all of my colleagues and um but I, i can only say that i i felt very um well or even like i i was like um how do you say like cuddled in a blanket by you and by your music or something like that <laughs> I love that. Well, what what you said about presence is maybe where I was getting at because you you have also a in a performance on stage there's there is a quite a presence when you're projecting voice and whether there's a microphone or not sometimes the, the voice doesn't need any amplification it's just 
going through the space and emitting a presence too. And I think so much about those, uh, what were, well, this, I think so much about space anyways, and, um, what's being transmitted through the performance. So yeah, I guess this presence is a really huge quality. Yeah. And obviously you have a, a talent and a way to, to foresee what is possible with this music, musician or singer, what can happen. And that I guess is just your amazing talent. <laughs> you use electronics. I, I don't, I'm not sure in all your compositions and, um, How how is your use with electronics or how did you come to to electronics? Yes. I often work with electronics and I have a comfort with them. Uh I work I have a pretty simple setup editing sound on a laptop with basic software. And I have worked with synthesizers, uh very various synthesizers. And I also have an intuitive approach approach to them. I find that um, I follow my ears and a, a feeling and I can get to an interesting place on a synthesizer. And I don't tire of this way of gathering materials and developing ideas. There is a nice immediacy to working with machines and um, I also like to generate a lot of ideas. I'm a really generative, creative person. And then I spend a lot of time editing and getting to the bits that are eventually released. But I have a high pro productivity in terms of experimenting and working through ideas. And machines are great for that because, you know, when you're in the mood and you have them around, then you hook everything up and you start to play and I also notice they do respond to you they really do and um so you develop a relationship with them and it's an, an incredible composing tool and aid that I'll, I'll always work with I think so they do make their way into many of the pieces sometimes it's more of a tool that ultimately draw some kind of sketch that I work from and we work from together with the performers. And sometimes it's a mix of, of um, synthesizers or other electronic sounds, acoustic. And the next ingredient I often work with is field recordings. So often it's a mix of these elements. And when we talked about your music also with your husband, we were wondering what is the label for it or if there is a label and um i mean in this podcast i often talk about new and experimental music and i was wondering well where does christina fit in and i'm i'm not even sure but i have the feeling for me it's a music that can reach many people and and even though i really feel it's your music it's not about whatever pleasing somebody but it still feel the power that it can reach a lot of people and i think you also have on certain platforms many many listeners and and downloads and um so how does it then fit in with whatever contemporary music and um how do you see it yourself well i i think my favorite um word is experimental music Because it is, uh, sometimes it needs a, a little explaining, depending on who you're talking with. But it's um, it's a very nice descriptive word that remains true through the years. It's always, there's always something experimental about it. And new new music is interesting. I think that's more for the contemporary classical community, this new music label. Some people use the word ambient music and in some cases that's true but ambient music is also a very broad term and um includes things that have nothing to do with the work that i do also um but it's a useful term sometimes and uh 
Um, there is a whole field recording genre that is niche, but there's, it also has a wide listenership. There's, um, so many benefits to these kind of sounds that might slow you down or get you into a, a state of concentration or focus or shift your mood. The music has this incredible, these incredible qualities. And yeah, there's not, there doesn't need to be any division um, for who might benefit from this type of music. And then the labels are handy for promotion and the platforms and everything. They have so many subgenres nowadays. Um, but yeah, all in all, I like experimental music the best, I think. Okay, great. And, um, well, we heard that you're experimenting a lot with the machines. And I would like to know, how do you structure your day? Is there a kind of structure or some time management? How do you get everything done that you're doing? <laughs> What is your secret? Oh, this is a big secret. <laughs> It's secret. a big secret. It's a big secret that I I take my time in the mornings. I start the day with fruit i like to eat fruit i also heard recently sakamoto say a very similar thing in an, one of his interviews someone asked him uh, when does he work on music in the day or something like this and he said certainly not before noon because before noon i'm eating fruits or he said something like that and i really connected with that um so that I have to, the, yeah, if I'm in a stressed, rushed state of mind because I have a lot going on, then it's, it's not the best moment to start working on music. So I, I have my fruit. I try to do the administrative tasks in the morning because I'm also handling that side of things. There's for every concert, many things to, organize and plan and I'm getting used to that over the years so I try to get that out of the way and then I tr do something in between to kind of slow my mind down and get a little more in the moment and in this body state that's um a really been necessary for me to work on music and the body I mean, you're working with your brain always because there's software to manage and I'm on a computer and I'm dealing with files, but there is this, um, you know, you have to sort of like have a enough quiet and nothing that will distract you in the next five hours. Five hours is a great amount of time. I, I found if you don't have any meeting or call or nobody's stopping by there's no errands to run in the next five hours then I can relax deeper and my body knows it and I can focus more on the task of composing music which inevitably takes many five-hour sessions or more but there's something about clearing the time and space to get into it that's really important And then it depends on where I am in a, in a work. In the beginning, I'm really intimidated. So, you know, I, I find all kinds of ways to do other things or, you know, I, I have to sometimes eat a lot of chocolate is my trick. <laughs> chocolate really. <I> said chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> If you, yeah, I always have a bar of chocolate near the, in the desk or, um, near the computer or in the studio. And yeah, the chocolate kind of, I don't know what it does, but somehow it loosens something and relaxes something, then, then I can dive in. And once I get going, I can go, 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 go. So then it's a matter of remembering to stop and eat and be uh, in the physical world, you know, all these things. I'm getting better through the years. So... That's kind of how it goes. And every day is different depending on the demands of the, the day. 
But if I go too much time without some music work, practice, something, I don't, I don't feel so good. I just don't. So I really prioritize it. Yeah. What are you thankful for today? Today? Oh, what am I thankful for? I'm thankful for this interview. It's really nice to take a moment to reflect. Uh, I would love to have opportunities to do that more often. There's so much time alone, actually, and working on and and um, gathering the energy that it takes to make a a project come alive and bringing the people together and all these things. And it's all very exciting, but um, we don't always uh, sit around and, and talk about what happens when a project's finished. And I think it's really good for, for, yeah, just for some pause, you know, this is always the next project and, I find it weird going, I often go running from one thing to another and multiple projects and you learn to deal with that dynamic um, rhythm. But uh, yeah, it's, it's really nice to, in order to evolve, to really think about how things have been and what, you know, what could be improved and where you want how you want music to operate for you this year and you know that changes year to year so yeah it's nice at the beginning of the year too to think about these things so i'm thankful for this moment of reflection and who and what has played the greatest role in shaping you and what inspires you one person is it who or what oh. Whatever you want to tell me, it can be anything. It doesn't have to be a person, but whatever sure. yeah. inspires you. Well, I'm really inspired by film. I love films and film scores and sound design for films. And if I'm working on a piece and want to test it, I often pull up a clip from a film that really that comes to mind or that holds, I don't know, that's that I, I want to see how the music plays against image often. And it's something I do on a regular basis also to resolve uh, if I'm a bit stuck. So there's something about sound and image together that is a continual inspiration to me. And there's, but there's many, many things that inspire me for sure. Um, nature, huge. We share a love for the sound of bird song. <laughs> yes, that's our little secret. <laughs> Endlessly inspiring. And yeah, just the, the, the feeling of if I'm alone in nature and I take, I start to take in the sound atmosphere and, and ultimately there's a lot going on and you're really, really listening. It's incredibly inspiring. So that's another big one too. Have you actually written music for a film yet? I haven't. I haven't. There's been some. Maybe that has to come to you. <laughs> I've had some scripts sent to me. Uh, there's a director or two that could be could listen to this and they know who they are and we're still talking. It's a long process to make a film and and um the composer director relationship is also really key it can be a really beautiful story there it can be also a horror story i know a lot you know plenty of colleagues have gone down that road and um but i'm i'm hopeful um uh i would love the challenge it would be a big work there would be It would mean gathering a team, you know, and, but I, I do that anyways, and I love doing that. So I could see myself, um, I could easily see myself doing that. And, 
and if it's a beautiful story and a beautiful cinematography, um, then I would, yeah, it would be really a dream. Yeah. Great. And what does it mean for you to be true to yourself and authentic in this music business? And how do you keep true to yourself? Wow. <laughs> well, I think at anywhere we are in life, these virtues are so important to guide us. And certainly in music, um, I wouldn't be still around making music if I hadn't grappled with this question. So um, you have to find your own, I guess the words gratification for the kind of energy we put into this work. It doesn't match the society's um, plan for us. <laughs> um, music is incredibly generous. I love that about music. It's a ge very generous art form. And I feel like a participant in every project I do, even if it's something I initiated, you know, and I use my own name and, I'm in, I feel like I'm really in, in service to the music, which is guiding. And so, yeah, there's a, already a spiritual quality to this philosophy of music. And, and then again, we're all far from some kind of um, give and be rewarded through the, the world of commerce that we're taught and we know it's something else totally so um you learn to build a value system i've i found as an artist that's true for you that keeps you thriving that um gives you a feeling that you are playing a role in um, the lives of those coming in the future, even, you know, music is something that can um, touch not only ourselves and our, our community now, but future generations. And, you know, you have to go inside yourself to arrive in the places where you um, find really meaning and what you're doing and and so I think that's a constant practice as well as making dreaming up projects and getting folks together and um performing and there is a, a constant going back inside and uh, knowing what you're doing really so um Yeah. And what does success mean for you? Well, success, uh, I've learned also through music to define that for myself. And um, when I'm in a performance and there's all these lovely people around and after the performance, you have incredible conversation with someone that you just met. I find this, this to be, um, I don't know if you could say that's a success, but I, the energy that it gives me is, is really um, important to me. And to feel like you can learn about yourself with music project by project and with meeting people and all the the ways music gathers people together and find that in those moments of gathering, there's something, there's something meaningful there to that. And there's an exchange. I find that exchange to, to be what you might call success. And what drives you forward or do you have a vision? Um, yeah, I always, uh, the vision is always very, important to me and I'm also a visual person 
So I, but I really believe in dreaming forward and letting imagination guide you. This is, I think, a, a huge um, magical power almost that we have as artists that we work with in a very real way. We dream things up, we have a vision and we, we go there and we watch how that whole process happens again and again. And I think the, the magic in that is, is what drives me. I, I love the magic in all of that. So the more I experience it, the more I trust in it and the more I'm willing to again, go out and learn Yeah, I thank you so much for this um, open and inspiring talk. And we are actually at the last question. And I would like to know from you, which tip would you like to give young artists? Uh, this is such a big question. <laughs> um, I think it's, uh, yeah, follow your dreams. You dare to dream and um, find out what uh, and find out who you are and what makes you shine and feel good. And um, I think it's really important to stay close to that music, just like anything else has, you know, you want to be something or do something to get recognition and, and be heard. And um, I think it's always best to be yourself. So uh, yeah, those are the words of advice I have for young people. <laughs> Christina, I thank you so much for our conversation today. And yeah, I hope to see you soon again. Thank you so much. This was the interview from today. I hope that it inspired you. And please send me your emails, send me your feedback, because I love to interact with you. Thank you very much that you tuned in with me today. I really, really hope that you liked it. And please tell your friends and colleagues about this podcast. I thank you very much. I wish you all the best. Live your music, live your life and see you next time. Yours, Irene.